All right. Hello, students. Uh, welcome to lecture number uh, eight, I think uh, this is. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about the fruit of the spirit today. And um, so um, for, for those of you watching this that are in my pneumatology class in uh, at Elon, which is the primary reason this lecture is, is being recorded, but um, I've made it public on YouTube. So other people are are able to watch it. Um, so quick housekeeping for those of you who are my students at, at Elon. Um, so this week, um, the, the, the topic for the week is the fruit of the spirit. And I hope that you've done your reading in Duffield <clears throat> because Duffield does a great job of discussing the fruit of the spirit. And to be perfectly frank with you, um, if you read Duffield, I, I just don't want to spend any extra time today sort of covering the material uh, that Duffield covers. And so we're going to do one thing in this lecture. Uh, we're going to uh, we're going to go through Galatians chapter five, verse by verse together. And so um, just like last week, uh, you may want to pause and go get your Bible. I will be reading from uh, the ESV. Um, so I would encourage you to grab an English translation of the Bible, uh, a modern English translation of the Bible um, as we go through this, because we're just going to go verse by verse and uh, see what Paul has to say and try to put his his discussion of fruit of the spirit uh, later on in this chapter in in some context that I think may give you some insight into um the import not just the importance but but what the fruit of the spirit means in the life of the christian believer there are going to be things we talk about as we expose um, galatians chapter 5 that um, we discussed you're going to see if you remember last week's lecture um, where we <clears throat> broke down john chapter 3 and romans 8 1 through 11 and I think that when we go through um, some of Paul's discourse, uh, particularly starting with verse 16, um, I really think you're going to hear Paul's voice uh, from Romans chapter 8. And at least I hope you do. We'll, we'll, I'll point it out uh, when we get there. And so open up your Bibles, uh, go to the New Testament book of Galatians uh, to the fifth chapter. Uh, pause the video if you need to to, to get ready. Um, grab a pen and, uh, and we'll get going. So, so my approach to studying the Bible um, is, is really a, a three-pronged approach. And I've taught this for years. I learned it in college. Uh, one of my professors in college who became, um, she was one of my professors in graduate school. She was my dissertation supervisor. I've, I've kept up with her, Dr. Kimberly Alexander, in a course I took at Lee University on um, methods of Bible study. Um, she taught us the inductive method of Bible study, which is observation, uh, interpretation, and application. It's where you go verse by verse, you make observations, and then you make um, interpretations based on those observations, and then you um, you make application. How can I apply this verse or this section of verses to my life? It's a very methodical approach. And even though I have, you know, years of theological training, I'm still working on my PhD. So it, it seems like it's never ending. But, but I, I just, I have discovered that if I will employ the principles of observation, application, or observation, interpretation, and application, then there are a lot of times when I'm reading the Bible that um, that I either don't need a commentary or I will read through a passage. I'll, I'll do my work, my observations. I'll do my interpretations and applications, but I'll grab a commentary just to make sure I'm on the right track because you, you know, you, you do want to hear other voices that you trust. And um, and I'll find out that without those commentaries, um, that I was able to arrive at um, the same conclusion. Uh, the only 
challenges you might have is if you don't know Greek or Hebrew, then that component is going to be missing a little bit, but you don't have to know Greek and Hebrew if you find trusted commentaries and sources where um, those scholars can work out some of those historical and, <clears throat> and grammatical issues for you. So we're going to start. Uh, I'm going to read the entire chapter, and then um, we're going to move pretty quickly uh, until we get to really, really verse 16. So I'm going to read through the whole chapter. I'm going to start making observations and some interpretations in uh, starting in verse one. And I'm going to try not to get too bogged down early um, because I want to make sure that, that I'm not out of gas by the time I get to verse 16. So, um, so let's go to God's word humbly. Um, let's go to God's word um, confidently that, that God has preserved this word for us um, for this moment. So uh, let's read together, starting in verse one of chapter five. Paul writes, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts, who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Ugh. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for they are opposed to each other. To keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and, the, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, 
provoking one another, envying one another. So may God add his blessing to his holy word. Thank you, God, for preserving this word for us. So I'm going to jump right in. So what we're going to do, verse by verse, just going to make some observations with uh, some interpretation packed in there. So verse one, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Freedom is the point of this letter, and freedom is what he opens chapter five with. The interesting thing about this statement, for freedom Christ has set us free, it's an abrupt statement that um, syntactically doesn't really have a link to the previous chapter. Here's the thing I want you to remember if you're fairly new to, to Bible study, if if you're fairly new to the inductive uh, Bible study, inductive being the observation, interpretation, and application. So um when the original authors wrote the books of the Bible, whether it was Moses in the Pentateuch or uh, the disciple John in the Revelation, they did not include chapters and verses. Those were added much later to help us find things and to sort of break up these letters in a way that makes them more easily digestible. It was a great idea to do that. It helps us to remember where things are. Um, it's an easy way to reference things. So if I say John 3.16, everybody knows, you know, either what that is because they memorized it or what is that? And they know where to go to get there because the verses and the, the, the chapters and the verses are marked. But when you're doing Bible study, when you're trying to understand a letter of the Bible, to some extent, um, you can ignore those, especially if the presence of a chapter number, like from chapter four in Galatians to chapter five. Don't put too much stock in those um, in those chapter numbers, at least not to the point that would hinder your ability to see what Paul is saying or whomever the writer is, but in this case, Paul, to see what the writer is saying logically. You want to be able to connect what they're saying. And so the interesting thing about um, chapter 5, verse 1, is that syntactically it, it doesn't seem to be linked. In other words, the phrase stands alone. It was a great place to start a new chapter for uh, the people who put um, the Bible together because it, or when I say put the Bible together, that were, that were, that were using these chapter headings or chapter divisions. And so um, Paul just sort of says it like aside almost, by the way, you know, almost. But the interesting thing about this is, is freedom is, is a concern of Paul's throughout this letter. And it is an important element in what Paul has to say after this. So it's not like it's just in there, but it's not connected to anything else. It, it struggles with a connection to the end of chapter four, but it certainly sets up chapter five for everything he's about to say. So the question should be from this point forward, and I'm spending more time on verse one than probably you thought I would, but it's important that you see what Paul's thinking is. And so what I want you to do is as we read, as we go through these verses that that from Paul's perspective, right, he's he's got this abrupt statement for freedom. Christ has set us free. So I want you. And if you were one of the Galatian at one of the members of the church in Galatia in the first century, I think what Paul would want you to do is ask yourself the question. Um, from what have we been liberated and to what have we been liberated? So let's go to first verse two. So in verse two. Paul begins his answer to those two questions. From what have you been liberated and to what have you been liberated? First, you have been set free from the basic requirements for entrance into the covenant. And secondly, circumcision has a broader meaning to include the entire law of Moses. So when he says circumcision here, he's not just talking about the act of circumcision. He's saying circumcision as really a synonym for the entire law. 
Um, he is also addressing the notion that the Galatians are considering circumcision here. If you read through the, the text, you see that um, he's, he warns them, if you let yourself be circumcised, right, you shouldn't do that. And so moving to verse three, here in verse three, Paul precisely equates the individual act of circumcision with the entire law. That's why he, he refers to it, circumcision as the law. He sort of, he sort of nails that nail right on into the board by equating the individual act with the entire law. So move to verse four. In verse four, uh, you are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from, from grace. In this verse, um, he says that attempting to follow the law gets people further from grace that's offered through Jesus. So he's making this case. You can kind of see where he's going. He's talking about freedom. We've been free, been set free from something. It looks like the thing we've been set free from is circumcision, which is a synonym for the law. Because um, if you are under the law, then you're getting further from Jesus. So if you can kind of track his thinking here, he's he's trying to make a case for, um, and we say the law, right? We refer to the, the law of Moses. You have to remember, Paul is a, he's a, he's Jewish. He's a, a Jewish lawyer. He's, he's a, He's an, an attorney by, by today's standards because the law of Moses was also the social law. It was the religious and the social law. And so, so that's why Paul talks about the law so much because Jesus was a Jew and Jesus came to fulfill the law. And so Paul, over and over in his letters, is whether he's writing to Gentiles or whether he's writing to Jews or a mixture, which is most of the most of the time it was a mixture of the two. He, he just feels the need to make this case that what Jesus did is relative to the way the way that God had established for people to be saved prior to Jesus. And that's the law of Moses, right? The way that you get redemption before Jesus from Moses to Jesus in between those was the law. And so everything that Jesus did is relative to the law. And so Paul makes that case over and over and over. He's not just making the case because he's, because he's a Jew and the law is important to him. He's making the case because everything that Jesus did is relative to the law. And here he uses circumcision as sort of an umbrella term uh, for the law. So verse five. For through the spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. So here's where our, here's where Paul's argument becomes relevant for pneumatology. Uh, Paul is contrasting righteousness through the law versus righteousness by faith through the spirit. And here's where he begins to make that argument. So, so the, the basis for the hope that Christians have, according to Paul, is their shared experience in the spirit received by faith. And Paul is going to argue elsewhere that that has been the basis for righteousness all along. Even though you have a law elsewhere, Paul is going to argue that it is it is faith. It is it is through the spirit, the experience of the spirit through faith um, that has really been the basis for righteousness all along. Verse six, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. So again, he's making the point. Um, he's talking about literal circumcision here not just an umbrella term for the law, even though you could make the case that that's an umbrella term for the law. But he's he's summarizing here, essentially saying getting circumcised or not really isn't the point. Faith expressing itself through love is the point which is brought about by the Spirit. Um, the, the next section, we're just uh, verses 7 through 15, we're just going to kind of kind of catch in one fell swoop because what Paul's doing, and I'm not going to read it, I, I've already read it, but what Paul's doing in verses 7 through 15 is he is encouraging the Galatians to stay the course 
and to ignore the Judaizers. And the Judaizers are people, that's a name or, you know, a, a, really a description given to people in the first century that would come in and say, we're all for Jesus, but you can't discount the law. Um, and so they would have people accept what Jesus did on the cross for them, but also uh, keep the law. They had a very difficult time with saying this, this standard written on stone tablets given to Moses at Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai. We have a very difficult time saying, all right, that's in the past. And so, um, so these Judaizers would come into these congregations and say, uh, you're right, Jesus is the Messiah. But we're not convinced that Jesus fulfilled the law the way that, that Paul and the other apostles are saying that Jesus uh, fulfilled the law. And they were, they, were, they were very influential. We even um, later in Galatians or earlier in Galatians, um, you know what? I don't remember where it is. I think it's earlier. Yeah. So earlier in Galatians, um, Paul talks about certain men from James that um, basically convinced Peter to go back and and to essentially Peter uh, toyed with being a Judaizer. Um, I think we know from First and Second Peter that Peter finally um, was was made free from that because the theology in first and second Peter is, is pretty solid theology. And he speaks very highly of Paul, um, in those letters. And so, um, but in seven through 15, what we have here is we have Paul encouraging the Galatians to stay the course and ignore those Judaizers. And he even goes as far as to say that, that if someone wants to be circumcised, why stop there? They should just go all the way and remove their male appendage. That's that's pretty harsh, right? But he's making a point. If if circumcision is so important to you, how much more importantly would it be just to cut the whole member off? Surely that's better. It's, so he's sort of being sarcastic there um, and, and tongue-in-cheek. But in verse 13, Paul circles back to the primary theme of, of both this this chapter and his entire letter to the Galatians, which is freedom. So now we're going to start uh, with verse 16. Paul starts with, uh, if the NIV, I think, says so. Um, the, um, the ESV starts with four. But Paul starts this next section connecting everything he said in the previous section to what he's about to say. Here's what he said up to this point. Freedom is the point. Following the law isn't freedom. That's kind of the point of the preceding 15 verses. So live by the Spirit is what he says in verse 16. The word that is translated live literally means walk around. It's sometimes translated walk of life. The NIV, the NIV translates it live, which I think is a better translation. To, to live uh, by the Spirit. I think that's a better translation. So everything he said up to this point in chapter 5 is related to the inadequacies of trying to gain righteousness, not righteousness by performing deeds. Circumcision. So live by the Spirit. This is Paul's antithesis to trying to live by the works of the law. So there are, there are two competing ways to live. You can live by the flesh or you can live by the spirit. You can live according to the law and circumcision or you can live according to the spirit. And this sounds almost exactly like the point that he was making in that passage that we covered last uh, the last lecture in Romans chapter 8. So Paul's answer to the Galatians who are being tempted to pursue a course of action that involves works-based righteousness, they're being tempted here, is for them to abandon that effort and instead live by the Spirit. You with me? He's shifting. The law had a place. Righteousness really came by faith through the Spirit the whole time. Now he's juxtaposed works of the law versus works of the Spirit 
and then he he shifts. So, meaning the works of the law is not that's not that's not effectual. So, live by the Spirit. Verse seventeen. Okay, verse seventeen. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for they are opposed to each other. So although Paul is making a shift in verse 17 away from the works of the law, he's not abandoning it because he wants to keep this front of mind for the Galatians, right? So in this verse, he's making a natural connection between performing works to obtain righteousness and other works of the flesh. And these works of the flesh are what Paul says, contrary to the spirit. Therefore, you should be led by the Spirit. Verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Because being led by the Spirit means you are not under the law. One or the other. You are one or or the other. You are either pursuing a workspace righteousness or you are pursuing the spirit-led life. Paul is still talking about the spirit in light of and juxtaposed to trying to earn righteousness through works. So Paul's emphasis is on an outward reality versus an inward reality. Verse 19 through 21. Now this is where we really get into the meat of what this lecture is about. So before you read verse 19, it's, under, it, it's important that you understand that he's not just talking about works of the sinful nature. He's making a point that if you pursue righteousness through works, then that pursuit means you are not living a spirit-led life. Now, we don't have as much of a problem today with trying to keep the law of Moses. But the law of Moses was, according to Paul, it was works of the flesh, right? But we do have a problem with legalism. Now, what legalism is, is it is anything you add to the gospel that you think earns you righteousness in God's eyes. So I want you to shift your focus. Unless you are Jewish and you're watching this and you're trying to understand how Judaism and Christianity are are really connected but different. I want you to think about not so much the law of Moses as you think about legalism. Now, I could do a couple of things here. I could just say legalism and I could move on. Or we could talk about some of the things we do that are legalistic, right? Uh, Ascribing certain dress patterns to women. Well, women can only wear dresses. Women have to cover their heads, can't cut their hair, can't wear makeup. Men have to wear long sleeves. Um, I, I have to, I have to do certain things like... I tithe so that God doesn't get mad at me, right? That's legalism, right? I go to church so that God sees me going to church and will reward me. That's legalism, right? That's works of the flesh. So any activity that you think earns you righteousness in God's eyes that you do or say, Anything you you do that you think, well, God's going to think I'm righteous if I do that. Whether you go through the thought process and you literally think that, or whether the way that you approach Christianity reveals that, right? Because sometimes people do things that they don't realize they're doing it, right? So if, if there's an activity that you participate in that you think God's going to think I'm a good guy for that, like God's going to give me a thumbs up for that, right? And I'm going to be righteous before God. That's legalism. And so so what Paul is saying 
what he's the, the case that he's about to make is that the pursuit of anything external to Jesus, external to the spirit of life, anything that you try to do to earn righteousness is, is antithetical to the spirit of God. So not leading a spirit-led life means that you are living a life controlled by your sin nature. When you live a life controlled by the sin nature, it produces the following. Starting in verse 19, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like these. So let's go through these. Let's make sure that we understand what these, what these fruit, if you will, fruit of the sin nature is. What, what, if you live a life where you try to earn God's righteousness, then you are susceptible to these works of the flesh, which are sexual immorality. The Greek word there is pornea. That's where we get our word pornography from. That includes all manner of sexual activity outside of marriage. That's prostitution, that's adultery, that's fornication, that's homosexuality, etc. So sexual immorality. Impurity. This is, this is uncleanness in a moral sense. It's very closely connected to sexual activity or sexual immorality rather. So Paul is trying to cast a wide net for the reader to mean that living according to the sinful nature produces a plethora of moral decay. He uses the word uh, uh, debauchery, sometimes translated to sensuality. And again, it carries the idea of sexual immorality, specifically homosexuality. Peter uses this word in 2 Peter 2.7 to refer to the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, and uh, the Roman historian Josephus uses this term when referencing homosexuality. This is a Greek word that is used in the context of, of homosexuality. So Paul is saying here, uh, this debauchery or this sensuality, um, this, is, um, this is related to homosexuality. Idolatry. This means image worship. Idolatry and sexual sins are very closely related for Paul. Um, he was an apostle to the Gentiles. He was constantly confronted with non-Jewish religions that, that almost daily, um, that, that worshipped various uh, gods of the maybe the, the Roman pantheon that, that had festivals. Um, and in these festivals, um, they would have um, temple prostitutes. Um, sexual immorality was sort of a product of, of these religions and and so the worship of these false deities so again it's it's related to sexual immorality but uh, sexual immorality primarily as it relates to the worship of, of false idols so idolatry witchcraft that means sorcery but is aligned to sorcery through the use of potions and spells uh, the Greek word, and I think this is funny because my full-time job is a pharmaceutical rep. Uh, the Greek word for for sorcery is uh, pharmakia, but it means witchcraft in the terms of potions and spells. So this carried a very sinister meaning for uh, for the people in the first century because that's how you murdered people. Sorcerers would commit murder through the use of potions and spells. So uh, this witchcraft, this word witchcraft, that um, Paul is using, um, Paul is using here sorcery is uh, aligned to this use of, of potions and spells. Hatred, ekstre, that's the the Greek word, um, means enmity. Um, it's connected to the previous use of pharmakia. Discord, also translated strife, it's uh, only used one other time in the New Testament. Paul uses it in Romans. 1617 to mean those who cause divisions. So engaging in activity that divides people is an act of sinful nature. Jealousy. Uh, 
zelos is is the Greek word. It's where we get the word uh, zealot from. It's associated with outbursts of the flesh, covetousness, um, wanting what your neighbor have, has, fits of rage, um, fits of anger. Um, thumoi is the Greek word there. It means passion, um, but it's an angry passion. Uh, it's the inability to control anger is a product of living outside of the leading of the Holy Spirit. And boy, that hits home for me because I, generally speaking, for most of my life, I've had a problem with my temper and, and anger. And sometimes it boils over. I, I tend to do great for months. And then one of my teenagers says something I don't like. And it's it it's like I throw away every bit of sanctification that God's done in me for the last six months. And it's it's demoralizing, but it is a product of of the sinful nature. Um, he says, uh, uh, selfish ambition is the word here, rivalry um, in a negative sense. It's it's a combination of selfishness and jealousy and anger. Um, he says, dissensions and divisions. This is, this is where we get the word dichotomy. It, the Greek word there means dichotomy. So in this context, if you, if you use it with, um, Erisace, it means factions. So it, what's being communicated here is people that divide other people. So it's dissensions and factions. Envy is very, uh, very near to jealousy. The word is associated with having a grudge against someone because of their prosperity. So your, your neighbor's got a boat, and I just don't like that guy. He's always out there washing that boat just throwing it in my face. My neighbor's got a brand new Chevrolet pickup and I drive this old beat up Dodge. Um, he doesn't have to keep shining that truck up and throwing that in my face. You know, this, this jealousy against someone else's success, that is so dangerous, particularly in our age of, of social media where everyone's highlight reel is on display and uh, you become jealous and envious and angry at other people because you know, they go to the beach all the time and I have to work like a dog or or um, it seems like these women are always riding around in their SUVs and drinking wine. And here I am barely able to keep my car running, uh, trying to make sure food's on the table like this, this jealousy of someone else's success. Uh, drunkenness he uses the word drunkenness uh, means intoxication. That's self-explanatory uh, orgies. Um, he's already talked about sexual sin, but. Um, the orgies he's speaking of here really goes with drunkenness um, because it's um, really describing a, a religious festival. Um, orgies were held to celebrate Dionysus, who was a Greek god of the grape, uh, grape harvest. And so drunkenness and orgies would go together. So he's got this list of works of the flesh. And so before we move forward, don't forget Everything Paul is saying here has pneumatological value. All these works of the flesh are what you can expect when you do not live life according to the spirit, but according to the flesh. When you try to achieve righteousness based on works, these things are what you can expect to constantly rear their head in your life. Then he says, but, right? So he's talked about all these works of the flesh and what they produced, but the fruit of the spirit, singular, one fruit. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. If the pursuit of righteousness through works leads to a life defined by acts of the sinful nature, which are products of slavery as far as Paul is concerned, what does the pursuit of righteousness by faith in the Spirit produce? And the answer is fruit of the Spirit. Living according to the sinful nature produces all these negative outcomes. 
but the spirit leads to fruit. Paul's use of the term fruit has meaning. Apple trees only produce apples that are genetically and ontologically connected to the type of tree they grow on. I covered this in a previous lecture. Uh, the Greek word ontos has to do with being. I am a human being, right? Human beings produce other human beings. Apple trees produce apples. Fig trees produce figs. And so what Paul is saying is that the spirit produces spiritual fruit. The fruit is ontologically connected to the spirit. It is of one origin and therefore one fruit. If you were to grow a spirit tree in your backyard, the fruit that would grow on that tree, this is essentially what Paul is saying, the fruit that would grow on that tree would be love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and selfness and self-control, right? So that's the fruit. That is what you can expect when you live by the spirit. So let's look at it. What are these fruit? Love, agape. In the New Testament, this refers to divine love. Living according to the spirit produces divine love in the Christian. Remember, Paul is writing here to people who formerly worshipped Greek gods and culturally and religiously sort of unfamiliar with the idea of God's love the way Jewish Christians would be. So, so love is not a singular virtue that Christians should express. Rather, it is the first and most defining characteristic. By love will you know that they are my disciples. And I think we should pray that God would, would check us regularly to make sure that, that the, the primary fruit that we are displaying, not fake, not faking it because you can't fake fruit on a tree, right? That we are naturally expressing love, that we are naturally engaged in the spirit enough so that we love, right? So love, joy, kara is related to the Greek word for grace, which is charis. It means delight. Uh, Jeremiah 29 or, or Jeremiah 9, 24 um, says God delights in his own exercise of kindness and justice and righteousness. And Paul is expressing another divine quality that is revealed in a spirit-led person, which is joy. Peace, erene. It must be understood again in a Jewish context. So in Jewish thought, peace is less about inner, inner tranquility and more about the corporate aspect so we're talking about social well-being and harmonious relationships. Peace as a spiritual fruit is juxtaposed against the divisive works of the flesh. Patience. It means long-tempered. Having patience toward others is a reflection of the Spirit in you. Kindness. This is juxtaposed against jealousy and envy. It reflects a favorable disposition towards others. When believers are living the spirit-filled life, they are naturally kind towards other people. Goodness, agathosane is, I, I'm sorry, um, agathosune, there you go. I had to get that right. It's related to generosity of time and resources. Like kindness, it is others-centric. Faithfulness, pistis. We talked about pistuo in the last, um, the last lecture. We talked about faith in Jesus, not faith that Jesus died, but faith in Jesus' um, atonement. Um, it comes from the word, the same word we get, faithfulness, which is pistis. It doesn't mean faithfulness to people or ideas. 
Paul is linking spirit and faith over and against works-based righteousness. What the spirit produces is not dedication to the works of the flesh, but to the continued expression of that same faith which the Galatians had first experienced. Faithfulness, gentleness. It's associated with humility in the same sense that Jesus humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Self-sacrificing is the opposite of, of hatred and discord and jealousy and fits of rage. Self-control is contrasted to the overall works of the flesh. The Greeks applauded self-control as a virtue. Paul is arguing that self-control is a product of the spirit. Any attempt at self-control outside of the work of the Spirit is counterfeit. This is instructive for Christians that try and induce self-control through external means. This type of self-control is fleeting. Self-control that is lasting and meaningful is a product of the Spirit-filled life. And then Paul says, against all of these, there is no law. Paul is saying that in order for the Spirit to flourish in the lives of of the Galatians, it is not reasonable to put yourself under the law. So he revisits his, his first argument. So then, how should we interpret Paul's use of the fruit of the Spirit? So number one, um, the fruit of the Spirit must be understood in a salvific context. One cannot express spiritual fruit without spiritual birth. The best someone can do is mimic spiritual fruit, but it won't last. And eventually you'll be able to see through it. Number two, the absence of spiritual fruit are works of the flesh. Even if one suppresses these works of the flesh because of cultural norms or um, whatever, they will appear in your life if your life is unaided by the Spirit. It's going to happen. Every time we stray from God and we try to live our, live our life on our own, we produce works of the flesh. Because when we, are, when we are aided by and under and filled with God's Spirit on a regular basis, it is the fruit of the Spirit that is produced. And I've been around the block more than once. And I wish I could say that, that living the Christian life is easy. It's simple, but it's not easy because we are constantly pulled to the world. We are constantly tempted. Um, the, the, there are shiny things and bells and whistles that really pull our attention away from Jesus. But the psalmist said, I have hid your word in my heart so that I will not sin against you. It is communion with God. And spending time in God's word, that is the, in my opinion, the number one activity that a human being who knows Jesus can engage in to escape these works of the flesh. Because it puts you under the umbrella of, of the spirit of God and, and recharges that spirit in you so that you won't sin against God. And it produces these spiritual fruit. So... So number one, so I, the question is, how should we interpret Paul's use of fruit of the Spirit? Number one, it has to be understood in a salvific context. Number two, the absence of spiritual fruit are works of the flesh. Um, number three, I think they're best understood in light of 2 Peter uh, 1, 3 through 4. Um, in that passage, um, 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4, Peter says, that we have these great and precious promises uh, whereby we become partakers. Your, your Bible may say participants in the divine nature. The process of sanctification, the process of living the spirit-filled life is literally God removing those vestiges of our sin nature and replacing it with his divine nature. God doesn't want us to, in a counterfeit way, try to mimic love and joy and peace and patience and the other fruit. 
What God wants is God wants to radically transform our inner person, our mind, our will, our emotions, and replace our sin nature with his holy nature. That's what Second Peter says. So then we don't have to try to be loving and joyful and peaceful and patient and kind and good and full of faith and self-controlled and gentle because our nature has changed. We are naturally loving and joyful and peaceful and patient and kind and good and full of faith and self-controlled and gentle. So that's, that's the third thing. And then finally, um, Paul reflects this principle in Galatians 5, 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have been crucified, have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Remember, crucifixion was horrific punishment. It, it hurt. It, it produced violent death. And Paul's use of the term is to be understood in terms of Jesus's crucifixion. His flesh nailed to the cross purchased the crucifixion of the flesh in those that believe, which is replaced by his divine nature, which produces spiritual fruit. So that is um, my take on the fruit of the spirit, um, at least as far as um, Galatians chapter five is concerned. So uh, that wraps up uh, this lecture on the fruit of the spirit. Hope you got something out of it. And um, I think that in in our Elam pneumatology class, I think I will do one more live lecture. And then um, uh, the next few weeks after that will be you focusing on your research paper and your final exam. So like always, if you have any questions or concerns, send me an email or um, students, you should have my cell phone number. Uh, you can send me a text. You can give me a call. Uh, thanks for showing up and uh, I'll see you next time.